Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our final session of today. I think we have uh, the perfect session to close the day with, which is a discussion on Southeast, Southeast Asia's largest and most vibrant market, Indonesia. I'm delighted to be joined by our three panelists. We have Ingan Tan, of, uh, managing, managing partner of Insignia Ventures, uh, uh, active and prolific early stage investor in Indonesia. We also have CEOs of two of Indonesia's largest fintech companies. We have uh, Jason Thompson of OVO and Akshay Gag of Adivo. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, let's kick things off by tackling the big question uh, that we've been given straight away, and then maybe we can expand the conversation from there. So the question is, uh, this big market translate to big advantage. Uh, and I think I'm going to get the uh, venture capitalist to go first on this. Ingan, your thoughts on this? Sure. Uh, your question was on, uh, you know, how Indonesia is faring on the pandemic, right? No, no, uh, the big, uh, this big market translates to big advantage. Ah, okay. Got it. Uh, yeah, I think the, the, there's two school of thoughts, right? I think one is that, uh, you know, uh, investors invest in big markets, uh, and you know, in a in a big win, anything can fly. Even pigs can fly. Uh, the other school of thought is that great founders find big markets, um, and and I think we have uh, always subscribed to the former, right? I think it's, if it's a uh, you see a A team B market versus a B team A market, uh, the A market B team sometimes or uh, usually wins actually. Um, but obviously, there's always the exceptional entrepreneur of which uh, Akshay and Jason are probably two of them, uh, which can navigate and pivot to find big markets. So I think I'm uh, more a believer in the in, in the market theory. Um, I think the 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 only exception to this rule is that um, in, early, in 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 when the market is just starting to develop, uh, it's not obvious uh, that it can be big. I think in the early days of Gojek, no one imagined the the market for um, uh, 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 you know, uh, two-wheeler Gojeks uh, could be expanded to food, to uh, delivering groceries, to delivering, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, 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 meals, uh, to delivering uh, parcels. So I think the imagination needs to be there, right? For, for uh, you know, how a initially mar initial market that may seem small, but they can expand into very large adjacencies. Got it. Okay. Action, Jason, you are... Both of you have uh, been an operator in uh, countries outside of Indonesia, running companies there before coming to Indonesia. So what's your take on uh, being a local player, taking advantage of the, the, the market? Actually, you want to go first? Actually, you want to go first? Oh, I'll go first. First of all, thanks a lot for having me here, Adi. It's really nice to be here alongside such esteemed individuals such as Jason and Minwa. Uh, as far as the question is concerned, look, I, I think the operator view is probably quite different from the investor view. I think uh, investors in general like big markets, as as Yingluan as himself said. By with a market and a B team, I think you're still better off than than a, than a B team with uh, than a B market with an A team. But I think the operator perspective is a little bit different. Look, I think big markets seem very, very, very good. I think on the surface. Uh, because, you know, uh, on paper, you get an opportunity to build a larger business, which is obviously nice. But I think big markets also go to level of competition, right? And at the end of the day, you know, this is where winning is uh, probably more important uh, than, 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 than participating, right? Uh, I think, I think uh, big markets tend to have their, their uh, pitfalls as well. Right. So look, I mean, I think that there's absolutely no denying that I think as a, as a starting point, if you can, I think you should try and find a big market. But I think, uh, you know, at the same time, look, I, mean, I think uh, just to reemphasize that point, I mean, I think they come with a con, which is that in general, there's just way more competition in them. And I think we see that, right, in Indonesia as an example compared to the region. And that translates into, into a real battle for survival. So uh, I don't know, jury's out, but, but it's definitely not easy to starting in a big market. Jason. I think, yeah, I think they're all 
very valid points, uh, actually, and I think we we share a very similar opinion as uh, as operating CEOs. So, um, I think you know, first of all, I look at numbers though. Um, you know, Indonesia, two hundred and seventy-one million people in the country, fourth largest uh, population in the world, seventeen thousand islands. So probably a negative when we think about infrastructure, um, language barriers, localization, localism. Um, 15%, 16% e electronic money penetration is still relatively early and, and makes things more difficult, you know, more expensive in terms of dispersal collections and control. So there's positive negatives in the number. Um, but if we look at it across Southeast Asia and the ASEAN region specifically, then you have to take um, the second, third and fourth size markets to even come close to Indonesia. And I think when you look at it from that perspective, you've got to think that you then have to localize, not just for Indonesia, but those markets, those regulators, those governance controls, and that takes time and that takes effort uh, and lobbying, understanding, et cetera. So I think I have a school of thoughts for different businesses. I think if you're in a distribution business that is a low governance threshold, I would regionalize. If you're in a govern high governance business, I believe the best way to, to come is to focus, to localize, and to, to focus on the problem you're solving. And, you know, whether it's in um, an early market or a late market, at some point, you always have the fun of competition. It, it's good for the customer. Um, so I, I'm with, actually, you know, the, it's a very competitive market, but I think that's good for the market overall. Okay. We, we often talk of Indonesia as a... Uh being a huge market, huge population. But I think a lot of tech companies are still only uh, scratching the surface in terms of the market they're capturing. Uh, many are still only targeting the big cities, you know, Jakarta, Bandung, Medan, Surabaya, those kind of cities. Uh, why, which is, that's only a fraction of the population, right? So why do you think this is? Is it, is it a lack of internet penetration, uh, infrastructure, uh, digital literacy? Uh, are these uh, second, third, or tier cities, are, are these even uh, addressable markets for a lot of uh, tech companies? Akshay, your views on this? Sure. Uh, look, I mean, I think our second and third tier cities, <clears throat> you know, good addressable markets. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, in general, I think in any market, right? I mean, you, you generally start with a dense urban areas and then you essentially have a little bit of a trickle down effect or a branching off effect. Right. That's generally what's happened in most, most sort of societies that have had like uh, high technology penetration. I think we forget sometimes Adi, that the Android revolution in Indonesia is still very young. Right. I mean, uh, I think those of us who are attending this conference might have actually had a high quality mobile phone for over 10 years now. But I think for the vast majority of people in tier two, tier three cities, that's a very recent development. Right. And that's really, in some ways, what is planting the infrastructure for this technology revolution that we're talking about in Indonesia, right? Now, I think COVID, I mean, obviously, this is, this is a crazy year, right? I mean, a lot of people have, have been hit very hard. Um, and our thoughts and prayers are obviously with that, uh, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that I think this is a, a very challenging year for Indonesia, as it is for many other countries around the globe, right? I mean, it's the first year since the 1997 financial crisis where Indonesia is going to see negative economic growth. So, so there is a lot of purchase power compression, right? Specifically with the, with the, with the poor uh, or, or lower middle segments of society, which tend to be disproportionately sort of, you know, rep, you know uh, represented across the tier two, tier three cities. So I think, I think, I mean, there, there's two sides to this. One, look, I mean, everyone's online now. People are consuming content across the board. When it comes to really consuming, let's say, real services that people have to pay for, right? I think COVID's a little bit of a two-headed beast, right? I mean, it's, it's enabling things simply because people are going out less. But I think it's also definitely kind of like, you know, make, make people think twice about whether they want to spend to access something, simply because I think that there's compression of purchasing power. In summary, look, I, I kind of feel like this, this is a one-way highway. There is just no question that over the next five to two years, there will be way more penetration and access of, of mobile enabled services of all kinds, media, financial services, healthcare, et cetera, across, you know, a lot of Indonesia. Okay. Yeah. Jason, uh, yeah. yeah, let me ask you about uh, sticking to the, uh, the topic of COVID. So uh, 
the logic is that uh, there's going to be higher adoption, uh, digital adoption, but also lower purchasing power from from the uh, the population. How has uh, how has it been for Ovo? How has it impacted Ovo's operation? Kind of touching on both subjects, really, COVID and expansion. You know, um, the way you expand digitally is is down to your usage model. So today, Ovo is actually. Um, we're, we're in 353 cities, towns. We're, we're not a premier, you know, we're not top tier. We're a national distribution asset. And so this is really important to us. So, you know, whether we're supporting events with the central bank in Kalimantan or whether it's in Madan, you know, we, we're very, um, there is localized teams there and we, we have to be there because a lot of our technology usage models are actually deployed globally, uh, sorry, nationally. So, you know, we can't be in the top 10 cities. It's just not, it doesn't work for our customer. And when I say our customer, I mean our strategic partners. So if you look at the adoption of, um, if you look at the adoption of digital service during COVID, at a user level, it's grown around at about 30%. So one in three people are new to, um, are new to technology, are new to online services during COVID. And from our surveys, 93% of those new users intend to continue to use the service when life normalizes here in Indonesia. So I think COVID has driven this mass adoption and that adoption hasn't just been in, in, in Jakarta, Surabaya, you know, et cetera. It's been a, a national adoption. Uh, we've seen growth of online of around 110%. Our user base, our, um, our user registration grew 276% in the first month of Pay Us Pay Bay. So you can see a massive influx into technology and we're seeing that with the support of, uh, as um, the communities are moving to digital products and moving to uh, devices with internet readiness, et cetera, we're seeing that adoption accelerate. So I'm very much aligned with that shape. First of all, um, I, I think the, the growth in Indonesia, and I genuinely believe with the attitude of Indonesia, that when post COVID, I think our um, return to GDP growth will be very, very quick. I think the general attitude here, you know, I can talk about Europeans being one, so I can say Europeans moan, you know, we're like, this happened, it's not my fault, the government needs to do it. Here in Indonesia, people just get on and fix things. They work out how they get around it, how they get over it, how they cleared the mud for a mudslide, what happens to get the water out of the house. What a wonderful attitude to life, like how we're gonna get through this. So I think with that attitude, we'll, we'll bounce back really quickly, but, Let's be, let's be clear that Indonesia is not a six city digitalization project. This is a national project. And I think one that the government and the central bank and you know, colleagues, industry colleagues like Akshay and I are proud of because we all play a part in it. England, how, uh, as an investor, how, how often or how important is it for uh, your companies, your portfolio companies to, to uh, go beyond uh, the big cities, uh, localize, hyper, hyper, go hyper local, and what what are the challenges for them? Yeah, no, it's a very good question because uh, in some of our fastest uh, growing companies, right, uh, it actually happened in the uh, rural cities. Uh, I, I mean, it's not unlike what happened in uh, China. In China, you know how Meituan really uh, grew was they, you know, they use the the saying is the rural cities surround the urban cities. And now uh, just to name an example, we have a company called Super, which is a social commerce company. Uh, during COVID in the past year or so, they grew by 130 times, right? Um, I think they really penetrate the second, third tier city. You know, there's this whole group buying culture uh, among the stay at home moms, you know, uh, and uh, it's really been an ongoing trend and COVID has accelerated this adoption. The other uh, company in the FinTech space is a company called PayFast, right? They have uh, about you know, a few hundred thousand agents uh, is really becoming the go-to financial platform for rural Indonesia. Um, so um, I think the the you know if you if you think about the mantra for uh, you know tech businesses in Indonesia is distribution, distribution, distribution. Right, you'll be a distribution first uh, uh, approach, uh, and a lot of you know the giant pool of the population is actually in the second third tier cities, and the sort of um, um, the the revenue model I think has to be adjusted accordingly. Okay. Actually, I wanted to ask you about uh, the investments, the deals. Uh, you've closed a, quite a big deal recently, and that was uh, during COVID. Uh, 
it's a, it's a, it's it's a period where you know credit uh, credit firms uh, lenders are maybe a bit uh, risk how how hard has it been to sort of uh, convince them to invest in uh, you yeah um, well well we're not when it comes to working with lenders or, or credit funds right who typically provide lending capital it's it's less a matter of convincing it's really about the data telling them the story right and giving them comfort right because this is this is a very hard nosed business right i mean the numbers are every and there's absolutely no question that it's been a challenging period for the country, right? I think there's a lot of anecdotal uh, news out there about a lot of portfolios being under uh, a severe amount of stress. A good part of the banking assets, uh, I think uh, double digit percentage are essentially under water, which is obviously unfortunate, right? Uh, I think uh, as far as how hard it's actually been, I mean, I think we've probably been a little bit luckier, right, than most. Uh, uh, but in general, our portfolios held out fairly well. I think um, we've obviously seen some stress, uh, notably in Q2, right? And then we really slowed down the business as any lending business model would do, right? Uh, we tooled a bunch of our underwriting and credit criteria, right? But uh, we are, um, I mean, I think for us, over the last few months, it's been back to normal, right? So uh, we haven't missed a beat. And part of the reason for that is that I think the more thoughtful lenders, right, uh, tend to take a very discerning view to a portfolio, right? I mean, uh, you, you don't really just say that, hey, everything is risky. Risk typically tends to spike in certain segments, mm -hmm. right? Uh, someone who is, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in a normal time, let's say even on the higher risk side, uh, but still acceptable, is now maybe over the, the, the line and you don't really, you know, approve them anymore. But someone who was very low risk, right? I mean, six months ago before COVID, it's still low risk. So there's really no change there. So as long as you, you, you're working with discerning investors and lenders who, who are able to understand the data, uh, understand the thoughtfulness around how you're actually approaching risk as a problem, right? Uh, I don't think anything has changed. And, and it's not just us, right? But I think there's a couple of other companies as well who've actually demonstrated uh, uh, you know, really strong resilience. I mean, some of our colleagues in our space, right, uh, on the SME side, Invest Group, right, also announced a very major funding round, right? Uh, there's a few others that have also closed some deals. So I think it really just comes down to, I think, quality of risk management and, and how you're able to, you know, have the data present, present the right picture to, to help people understand, right, uh, where the risk is actually coalescing and then really segment that out. In general, I think my core message here is that, look, it's, it's business as usual, not just for us, but a lot of other lenders and banks as well who are extending credit. Jason, prior to COVID, uh, OVO was, has been sort of aggressively expanding into uh, different verticals. Uh, have you had to sort of put a break on, on your growth because of COVID? We, we've continued to diversify. So... We've moved into five verticals now. The, the team is separated into five verticals as businesses and they run independently. Um, so no change. I mean, uh, our insurance business, uh, I'm really excited about that this year. I uh, spent some time with the team this morning going through um, our roadmap for the next 12 months. I think there's a, a massive opportunity for disruption in insurance through digital transformation. Um, the lending business is diversified. It was very consumer centric in 2020 and 2019. It's become a lot more balanced between uh, consumerism and, and business as we look to supply chain and different methodologies of lending. Um, the business with Barexa, the investment business, really excited about that. We've made announcements on secondary trading of government bonds, gold and many other things. So quite the opposite, actually, where uh, we feel very upbeat, focused, we've got a good plan. And I'd also like to build on what actually I said. I think um, I liken somewhat, you know, let's take away COVID because COVID impact is also, there is also an impact to the investment market, which was pre-COVID. Mm. I think the investment market is a little bit like pre.com.com. I mean, I, I, actually, I think we, you know, we're not too dissimilar age. We'll both remember it and have some scars. Uh, so, you know, before dot-com burst, everybody was, you know, it's a, I, I've got so many customers, I've got this, and valuations become extraordinarily high. And there was no reality in the business plan. Um, you know, my business plan is a clear sustainability path to profitability. We're on track with it. 
our EBITDA improvements around 11% per quarter, revenue growth is very high. Um, it's the reality of running a business. If, you, if you're going to raise money, you've got to credentialize that business and you've got to have a path to return. And I think there's been a correction in the market. Now, I still see a high appetite for investment. I'm nodding around at the moment, but there's a lot of interest. So I think for the right business with the right leadership and the right plan and the right data, I think there is a, a strong market of investment right now. I don't think that's changed. For businesses that are still anchoring on narrative over credentializing something, I think it's a tough time to raise money. Okay. Yingluan, uh, talking about the investment, a lot of people are saying that uh, Currently, it's much is a buyer's market with discounted valuations and so on. But the companies that make it through, uh, they're going to enjoy a, a seller's market. Do you, do you agree with this? What, what's your view on this? I think. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for Jason. No, you can go ahead. Okay, okay. No, I think that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, uh, the answer can be just. Uh, you know, uh, answer visually. We were thinking about a V-shaped recovery, uh, but actually probably more like a U-shaped, but I think the more actual one is a K-shaped recovery, right? Where the best companies tend to do much better and uh, it's sort of the uh, ailing companies will tend to struggle more. Um, and I think, you know, it's really a tale of two cities, right? I think some companies really benefited from COVID, right? I mean, distance learning, future of work, you know, Zoom, the platform which you are on, definitely fit into that. Fit into that acceleration of shopping on the internet, you know, uh, more first-time users shopping online, urban same-day delivery logistics. Uh, you know, I think this, these are just digitization of offline to online. I think this has just accelerated. Um, I think things that are not doing well got ha and got hammered, I think the travel industry, hospitality, cruise ship, anything that requires a gathering of people, I think, you, you know, you go through the portfolio that's, you know, great winners and some losers. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, it's very easy during COVID to see, to distinguish between founders who know what they're doing and those who don't. Um, and you know, those who know what they're doing tend to come out better on the other side. And that's where you spend more time with them, you deploy more capital to them. Um, uh, but even in this situation, you get it wrong, right? Uh, you know, if we, are, if we got it right all the time, we are not taking enough risks. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's sort of our observation here. Jason? Yeah, I think it's a bias. I think it depends where you are. I think if you're in a difficult situation and you weren't set up for success pre-COVID, I think it's a bias market. Um, but I think there's some good businesses that are sustaining through this, showing growth, and they're, they're credentializing those businesses. You know, our businesses are in very different stages. The, um, the payments business is now relevant. It's now moving to sustainability. The insurance business is in ideation. The... Um, the, in, uh, the lending business is really in refinement, ready for scalability. I think that's really important. They're all in different places, but we anchor on four principles with everything we do. That we look for mass distribution that allows us to get scalability. We look for uh, low friction, high velocity. Everything we do, we, we look at stripping back the, the friction, but we still have to maintain things like risk fraud, identity. So it's not the cost of good metrics. I think. I've shared in these sessions before, you know, fraud for us is a 0, 0.000 number. It's not a full percentages like most businesses in Indonesia. Um, we then look at instant gratification, something like Berexa and buying um, investment. It means you complete, you see your investment. You do that through a bank, two days later. Very, very different customer journey. And then instant liquidity is a reverse psychology, but it's very important on the cash market. Um, you know, so we, we really anchor on our customers and then we look at each of the businesses and the way we execute those, business, those principles in each business is very, very different. Um, so I think the way to run a business in any market is you've got to be very, very customer centric. And I find the Indonesian market more than most is very sensitive to that. Um, so I, I love it here. I, I, I think I've probably learned more in the last three years in Indonesia than the entirety of my last two jobs, which spanned 13 years. You, you guys teach some hard lessons and I really like it. <laughs> okay, anything to add? Uh, no, I was just uh, smiling about what Jason said. Look, I mean, the customer is something amazing, right? I mean, the customer is a person, obviously. We're all serving, serving uh, 
uh, individuals. Uh, but I mean, the customer is a deeply unsatisfied beat, you know, uh, as, a, as a general, I've got to choose my words carefully. I'm not trying to, to mock our customers when I say a deeply unsatisfied beast. It's, it's something that you have to constantly worry about, right? Uh, think about how to stay ahead of their evolving needs, right? And, and really be top of mind for them because in general, they're just, uh, you know, always unsatisfied, right? Uh, a, a, as a very general sort of, you know, characterization. So, so customers are unforgiving. And I think that's the magic of being in a, in a large country, right? That uh, regardless of what you do, there, there's always more to do. So it's very humbling, but it's a very deeply gratifying experience to, to operate a business in a, in a high growth, large market. Yeah. You've got to love the customer, right? Here, you've got to, more than any market in the world, I, I spend time with, and, and I love the customers here. I genuinely love being in Indonesia. And I, I mean, it's heartfelt. But more than ever, I, I've had to learn more about the way the customer thinks here, more than, you know, I feel like when I look back at Microsoft, I, I knew nothing about my customer when I worked there. You know, <laughs> not in comparison. So I'm fully aligned with Akshay. It's, it's a great journey. Okay, let's move on to some questions on fintech. Uh, Inglan, uh, I want to get uh, fintech, especially uh, particularly payment lending. Do you think uh, in payment and lending there's still room for new players to come in and take a piece of the pie, or is it uh, actually in a phase where it's gearing towards cons consolidation? I think Akshay has uh, won it all, uh, and of course Jason as well for payments. <laughs> but I, I guess, uh, yeah, you know, to the extent that they are willing to share some part of the pie, I think the the few trends that we are seeing uh, is that I think the first wave of fintech was really uh, unbundling of all the bank operations, right? Uh, where you see, you know, a lot of the single uh, uh, sort of purpose uh, type. Um, you know, uh, players spin out, uh, either they do lending or they do asset management, or they do credit card comparison, among other things. What they really, what they quickly realized was that um, it, there was a lot of customer acquisition costs. They spent a lot of marketing. There was regulatory issues. Uh, and uh, the standalone um, a product has no stickiness, right? there's no network effects. So I think what we are starting to see, um, you know, not only in Indonesia, but in other markets, is a rebundling of uh, services where you have, uh, you know, um, uh, multiple services uh, where, you know, you could acquire a customer, but you could uh, upsell the other services. There's more regulatory, uh, uh, you know, coverage. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a better way uh, for um, companies to be built uh, over time. At least that's one of the key trends we, we see here. Um, I, I, another trend we see, of, of course, you know, I think Jason will know this story well, which is the, uh, you know, the big unicorns, the decacons also, you know, not being satisfied with their own core business, but also branching into fintech as a ancillary vertical. And I think the advantage they have is, is immense because they have a distribution channel already, which which is a latent advantage. So I think we're starting to see that as well. Um, uh, I you know, if you look at a story in China, um, uh, in lending, right? I think you know, I think the whole like few thousand. There was, at one point in time, there was like few thousand P two P lending players. I think they were all decimated with the regulatory change. I think there was like two or three remaining. And even those that are uh, left are, you know, um, uh, are not trading that well. In, I mean, the independent players. Whereas, um, you know, I, I guess the larger platforms uh, tend to be more uh, resilient. So I think that's. I think this 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 sort of uh, movie will probably play out in a similar extent in Indonesia. Jason, what's your take on this? Just a sec. Yeah, I think um, Chinese regulation was behind the curve, and I think that impacted a lot of consumers, uh, certainly in P2P lending. So that's been redressed quite quickly. And we've seen, uh, you know, as, as shared, the, we've seen a huge proportion of that market collapse. And, and rightly so, you know, there was customers' money lost and it needed to be regulated and changed. I think Ojukara and uh, Bank Indonesia here, they're trying to get the right balance of uh, regulatory growth with market growth. And I, I don't think that's easy. So I think they're both very connected to the, the platforms, the discussions, it's very active. We do good learning. And so we've got to get that balance of regulatory control governance and, and market penetration right. And, and that's a hard balance. But in terms of sustainability, I do see in China, you know, if you look at China as fintech, yes, there's some large players, but it's actually a very big ecosystem. There are a lot, you know, there's more than two wallets in China. There's lots of wallets in China, some of them more niche, 
solving specialist things, some of more generalized, but there is two dominant wallets in China. And I think that will play very similar here. That will be one, two, three dominant wallets because customers don't want a spread of their capital. They want it centralized and usable. Um, in terms of, of lending, et cetera, I do see that the, you know, I, you know, I just got to work in on, on new regulation, BI constantly. I, I think new regulation is needed and continues to be needed. And I think that will protect the customer and protect the merchant. I'm very supportive. In terms of, you know, large platform v open platform, I, I don't believe that customers like to be trapped. You know, if you look at Alibaba, it's actually a very open platform. It's a very open ecosystem. With, with banks, with fintech, a lot of the transactions on, on Ant Financial are off Baba. It's not, you know, it's a multi-layer open ecosystem. That's really our philosophy. So we work with other lenders. We work with other insurance. We work with other investment companies. We're a, we're a dispersal and a collections company. We also lend to some people. We believe that that's the right philosophy to work with the industry and drive digital transformation. I, I think when we talk about financial inclusion, causation, well, it's digital transformation because the physical world won't get there. So our role is to work with partners, with platforms, and to a degree with a lot of other fintechs to, to bring that digital transformation. I think that's our role. Okay. Actually, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, we are seeing uh, quite a few uh, fintech players, including OVO, who's uh, evolving into some uh, kind of uh, super app, a financial super app, uh, you know, uh, uh, expanding into different verticals. Whereas Credivo, what I'm seeing is you're sticking to your, your core business of uh, credit, online credit. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the thinking behind this? Have you been uh, sort of tempted into uh, expanding into other verticals too? No. Why not? Um, well, look, it, it's, it's, it's a very important question. And look, I think I would be lying if I actually said that there's a black and white answer to this, right? I think at different points, we debate the question in different ways. First of all, I mean, we've had no desire to, to compete the same way with, uh, you know, uh, Ovo, for example, which is the equivalent of a super app. I think it's incredible what Jason and the team are actually building, and it's beyond our capabilities today, right? We wouldn't even aspire to that. I think it really just comes down to core competency. Right? I think we're, we're really, really big believers in core competency, right? And uh, credit is, uh, I'm not quite sure why, but a lot of people just kind of think it's very easy to, to build a credit business, right? Um, uh, it's not. It's, it's a very deeply specialized place. And our view is that we need to get really good at it, right? And, and uh, you know, want become one of the more dominant players in that credit space before we actually think about doing something else. Right now, now you know. I mean, the jury's out. You could argue that it's totally fine to go expand in a few different areas, right? Or, for example, expand internationally even before you've actually achieved critical mass in a single market. But our view is just that look, it's it's more important to really focus on your whole market, right? And and win, you know, a very significant share first. You need not be number one, but you've got to be one of the top couple, right? Because uh, that's the business that we're in. What business is winning, right? Really, really ending up in the top few before you really think about doing something else. And, and you know, just as a backhand compliment to, to I think, Jason, Ovo, and some other players in the market, I think, you know, uh, everything that Ovo is doing in terms of becoming a super app and so many others, developing into so many other services has actually happened on the back of, I think, a certain amount of dominance and payments. You know, uh, the other services didn't start on day one. So I think we eventually do, do plan to get into other spaces on the credit side, whether it's healthcare loans, education loans, et cetera, but we intend to stick very closely with our core competency, which is really around credit. Oh, I'm going to go into... Conference. Okay. Um, we, we have some questions from the audience, uh, but before that, just can I get, get a, uh, your quick sort of a response or reaction to the question of the Omnibor and what you think of it and how do you think it will impact uh, the ecosystem, the tech ecosystem in Indonesia? England, you, do you want to start on this? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. What was the first part of the question? Uh, the Omnibus Law. What's your take? What's, how do you think will impact companies? Oh, that's a good one. I'll, I'll defer to uh, our friends uh, Akshay and Jason who are more on the ground. 
Sure, sure. I mean, I'm happy to just, uh, I, I actually don't think it's going to impact us a lot. I mean, I think it's a very well-intentioned law party. Um, I think it was a part of President Djokovic's re-election campaign to, to essentially make business, foreign businesses enter easier, right? Uh, have, have less uh, red tape. Uh, also cut down on the amount of red tape when it comes to hiring and letting people go. And uh, obviously it's very well intentioned because the facts are the facts in general. I think Indonesia's position in terms of ease of doing business, etc., has been stagnating over the last few years. Um, and Djokovic is really, you know, back in power on the reforms flank. And I think what he's doing is in line with this. Right? But, but in terms of the impact to technology businesses, I mean, I'll let Jason speak for himself, but I kind of feel like, you know, um, uh, ease of setting up business. Well, we're already set up, and I think we're dealing with the red tape, and I think we're managing, and it's okay. We wish it would to be a little bit lighter, but but I think uh, you know we're we're all managing very well. Uh, I think as far as letting people go, hiring easier, firing easier. You know, I mean, companies like us already take really good care of our people. So I think uh, the omnibus law is probably going to affect, I would say, you know, companies that are probably at the lowest edge, right, uh, where workers who did not have protections, right, uh, are now going to be devoid of even more basic protections, simply because it's easier to fire people. That, that's one of the big sort of controversial points under the omnibus law. But I think for, for companies in the technology sector like us, I think I think uh, it's it's neutral. That, that's at least my view. Jason, I, I don't know about yours. Mm. I'd, I'd like to just correct a, 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 a we are far from dominant, my friend. <laughs> we're we're, a, we're still a very young player, and payments here is still very young. So I think you know we've made a good start, and thank you for the kind words. But we are still a very young company, very low penetration. And I think the future of Indonesia is in the, the nascent stages still. Um, I think there's a long way for us to go for all. Um, I think in terms of the law, I think it's a really challenging thing to do in any country. It's not, you know, Indonesia isn't the only country that's having that challenge around how do you develop employment law and labor law and allow foreign investment, because those things are often closely associated. So I think it's very much like the, the balance of uh, financial literacy and inclusion and regulation is foreign investment and labor law. So I think it's important that those things do co-develop and I think it will bring uh, more confidence in foreign investment having a developed labor law. How that balance is locally, what's right and wrong, I'm not best placed to discuss that. I don't think I have the right knowledge or experience in Indonesia, but I think there has to be the same way regulation develops with foreign investment, there has to be labor law developments as well. And, and that's not just about fintech. I think that's about all investment. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how you feel as, a, as a, an investor, but that, that's how I feel that there has to be a, a real, you know, to give confidence investments, there has to be the right conditions. A part of that condition is, the, is employment law. Okay. Let me go into the uh, question from the audience. Uh, one question for Jason. Jason, you mentioned that China benefits from a large ecosystem where there are more than two e-wallets. How do you think the Dana Ovo merger impact will impact the Asia ecosystem? Um, I'm not aware of a Dana Ovo merger, so I <laughs> presume that that's presumptuous. Um, I think when we look at the marketplace, um, I think what's going to happen in Indonesia, all told, all fintech sectors, is you'll see consolidation over the next. Um, X number of years, just like China, just like Europe, just like North American industry. So we'll see industry consolidation. Um, but I, I still think it's relatively, I still think it's very early in Indonesia. I think, you know, I, I think we, actually and I will see competition next year. We don't even know about yet. That, that's the reality. And the one thing that I know about Indonesia is there is always new competition coming and you should always be ready for it. And they're competing for hearts and minds of our customers. And that's a great fight. The customer wins. England, maybe this one you can take. Do we see Indonesia technology businesses being the ones that will become the regional champions for South Asia? Or do we see it being technology businesses with headquarters in other countries in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, we continue to see, I guess, two types of uh, fairly large companies being formed, right? I think one is... Uh, the latter, which you just described, Singapore headquartered, but you know having a, 
uh, regional operations. I, you know, there's a joke that you know uh, the ideal company, the Singapore headquarter company, with Indonesia market, with a Thai UX UI designer, with uh, Vietnam engineers, and uh, you know maybe with uh, a Malaysia as a secondary market. Uh, that company doesn't exist. Uh, you know, maybe one or two companies fit that description. Uh, but I think that that is harder to find. Uh, but I think the the real opportunity, if you want to build a large enough company, will have be, will have to be a large enough market to in in, in line with the topic of the panel, um, which is in Indonesia. I think the Indonesia is probably the singular market standalone that if you want to build a, you know, maybe a $10 billion company that you could probably potentially do it in, in one country, right? And uh, I would say that the um, uh, the raw material required is, you know, is much more available than uh, five, 10 years ago. Uh, there's you know, more engineers available, more talent, there's more returnees, uh, regulations, which you just mentioned, is getting more friendly uh, for uh, both uh, investors and entrepreneurs. Um, uh, of course, there's you know uh, more capital coming to the region. So I think you have all the factors of production uh, that spells very well for the future of uh, Indonesian entrepreneurship. And I think uh, lots of things is also happening in IDX, right? So even with a more fluid exit route, I think that's going to both good things for, for the Indonesian entrepreneurship landscape. Let's close with a uh, question each for Akshay and Jason. Akshay, uh, how do you see Indonesia in 2021, what can we uh, ex expect from Credivo next year? Oh boy. Well, well, I think so. That's two questions, right? I'll just take the first one. In terms <laughs> of how do we see Indonesia in 2021? What was that question more about how do we see Credivo in 2021? Which one of the two was it? The second one. The second one. How do we see Credivo in 2021? Well, I think um, uh, whoever asked that question, if you don't mind, if I just give you a slightly longer term view. Uh, we have a pretty deep mission. I mean, the company started as, as an e-commerce financing platform about four years ago, four, four and a half years ago. But we've always had a very deep mission of essentially serving, uh, you know, a double-digit uh, million number of customers with, with, with low-cost credit. This is one of the most underbanked countries, right? When people talk about Indonesia as unbanked, we actually disagree very respectfully. It's a country where there's adequately high penetration of bank accounts. The issue is that outside of the basic bank account, most people don't get access to many other financial services, right? Uh, so, so the right term that we tend to use is underbanked. And, and our goal is to essentially make low-cost credit, right, available to a very large number of other bank users. So, so we're out working towards a mission of serving up to 10 million customers over the next four years with access to very low-cost credit in the form of e-commerce financing, personal loans, education, healthcare loans. What you should expect next year is, is, is a lot more on this front from us, right? I think we're, we're pretty singularly focused on that goal, uh, simply because I think it's very important to us to, 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 to make a really big dent when it comes to financial inclusion in the form of low-cost access to credit. Okay, Jason? Same question, uh, what can we expect from OVO? Any uh, new verticals you're uh, venturing into? No, um, it's really about focus on execution for us, focus on the customer. I think in every one of our verticals, there's a lot of improvement. We want to improve the, uh, the way our customer feels about our application, our payments, the way we're dispersing. But the biggest thing I think you'll see from us is our ecosystem will grow significantly. People that I think historically you've deemed as our competitors, I think you'll see us grow our ecosystem. So that will be in lending, that will be in payments, that will be in insurance. We really take in this role of digital transformation seriously. So if you take the identification, registration and, um, and fraud, we want to be able to take what we've learned, what we've developed specifically for this market and allow other fintechs to use it. We want to combine our efforts together on data so we can accelerate financial inclusion. We want to take more products and more services through mass dispersal. We want to be in more places. So I think what you'll see from us is um, very similar to China, that FinTech is an ecosystem. You'll see OVO play a bigger role in an ecosystem and we'll invite more and more organizations to, to join with us and work together. Um, and for the benefit of financial inclusion, I think it's a good time for um, industry maturity at this stage. I think everybody fighting for the same space, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily the best way to drive the right behavior in the country, the right economics and the right future strategy for Indonesia. So 
I've really been pivoting my strategy towards digital transformation and inviting many other organizations to, to join with us and work together. Um, I, I hope that um, by doing that, we, we accelerate the one thing that we're all here to do, and that's help the people that need it most. Thank you, gentlemen. Our, our time is up. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I uh, hope to see you around soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Adi. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great moderation, Adi. I think.